I remember the day I was in Australia. It was the start of 2018 and I was going through a divorce, walking through it publicly and in ministry. I don't think that's ever the plan when someone walks down the aisle that it's not going to work out. And I was devastated. I was heartbroken. And over the last few years, I've learned how to allow that scar be part of my story, but not be the title of who I am. Does that make sense? And so I think sometimes the scars we have feel like the identity we carry. And the woman with the issue of blood in the Bible, people knew her by her issue. But when Jesus healed her at the end, he said, now go daughter. I love being able to help women specifically see that you don't have to hide your scars and you don't have to be identified by them either. Welcome to the Dr. Dab Show. Today, I have a very beautiful, wonderful guest with me, Elise Murphy. Elise is a Christian-based entrepreneur who is devoted to using all of her platforms to have meaningful conversations. She is an accomplished author, speaker, and a social media influencer who constantly seeks to help women in their darkness and setbacks step into their God-given light. Elise co-founded Club Devotion, a global community of women who are committed to living a lifestyle of devotion, and she's here today with us to chat. So welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for having me. Your so place is welcome. awesome. Thank you. I have actually watched a few of your episodes this morning and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so fun. <laughs> so I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that you're here too. And you know, you do have an accent that I'm not used to. I do. That's where you're from. I, my mom gave it to me and I could not do anything about it. Um, these days it's a little mixed up because I have been in America for like 10 years, but I am from Australia originally and that I'm so proud to be Australian. I love it. And I love kind of being in Los Angeles for a lot of years. And so having that like mixed cultural backgrounds of everyone's kind of, LA feels like the melting pot, right? It of is. Everyone's from somewhere else. And so it was kind of cool to be in here for so many years where everyone's from somewhere and I get to be Australian. I know. So it's so different. That's I'm, the accent. You're the first Australian I've ever met. It feels life. like a lot of pressure, but <laughs> I will try to do us proud. <laughs> No, you're such an inspiration Mm. and you've built a beautiful platform on sharing your scars, Mm -hmm. the things that have happened in your life that Mm -hmm. you feel that God wanted you to show the world. And you mentioned once in something that I heard you speak about when you talked about Jesus showing his scars Mm -hmm. after he was brought up again, resurrected. Yeah. He showed his scars. He still had them. Yeah. And he showed them. And we would love to know what scars have you been given yeah. to show the world? Yeah, I think I remember the day, it was actually my sister-in-law, Belinda, or we call her Bindi. Everyone in Australia has a nickname. That's, that's the first thing you need to know. Okay, what's um, yours? Um, Elise. Oh, my family calls me Lisey, but I've never said that publicly because <laughs> then people are like, Lisey? I'm like, no, 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 that's like the family nickname, you guys. So that's... You can't call me that. Yeah, my dad calls me that. And in front of other people, I'm like, dad, stop. But... <laughs> Belinda, my sister-in-law, I remember the day I was in Australia. It was the start of 2018 and I was going through a divorce, walking through it publicly and in ministry. I don't think that's ever the plan when someone walks down the aisle that it's not going to work out. And I was devastated. I was heartbroken. And over the last few years, I've learned how to allow that scar be part of my story, but not be the title of who I am. Does that make sense? And so I think sometimes the scars we have feel like the identity we carry. And the woman with the issue of blood in the Bible, people knew her by her issue. But when Jesus healed her at the end, he said, now go daughter. I love being able to help women specifically see that you don't have to hide your scars and you don't have to be identified by them either. And so that's one of my scars is that I was walking through this messily, trying to figure it out stumbling, knowing a lot of people in the church have gone through divorce and wondering why we don't talk about it, suddenly finding myself in it. Maybe God just knows I'm a big mouth. So he lets me go through stuff because he's like, well, she'll talk about it. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I remember sitting on the beach that day in Australia in the summer, actually funnily enough around this time of year, and my sister-in-law was texting me and she just said, hey, Lise, like you can talk about your story even before it's fully wrapped up with a bow. I think sometimes we feel like we need to wait for everything to be perfect, not realizing that that happens when we get to heaven. And before that, no one's perfect, no matter what Instagram says. 
But then there's this other extreme of, do I talk about it when it's got the bow wrapped up and I'm married again with kids and the whole thing's done? And then I also didn't want to just like bleed over everybody because the scar has started its healing process, right? Right. And so for me, I was kind of in that middle messy place of, I don't know what to say. I'm embarrassed. I'm dealing with shame. I'm heartbroken as anything. I don't even know what my future holds. And I remember her texting me one day and saying, Lisa, I heard this quote once. And she's like, I can't remember where I heard it from, but it was that Jesus wasn't scared to show his scars. So why are you? I remember sitting on the beach and the Holy Spirit speaking to me so clearly, not an audible voice, just like this. Some people might call it their gut intuition or I knew it was God. And he was like, at least that's going to be a part of your story. I want you to know that. This isn't just Belinda telling you something that was like cool on Pinterest. I am speaking to you. And ever since then, it's kind of just become this little mantra of mine of Jesus, you weren't afraid to show your scars. So I'm not going to be afraid to show mine. And that doesn't mean I'm going to bleed over people because again, a scar shows that you've started the healing process. But I think sometimes we try to wait a little too long and um, and maybe we wonder why our story doesn't resonate with people. It's because same kind of thing is that this is going to be a weird analogy, but I use weird analogies sometimes. You know that guy that used to play football in college? Now he works at a desk nine to five and he's like in his 60s. But every time the Super Bowl comes along, <laughs> he has the woulda, shoulda, coulda of like the people on the field oh, yeah. and what they should be doing. And, and I think sometimes when we wait so long to share, sometimes we sound more like that guy than someone that's relating to you in your bruise or your bleeding right now. And in order for you to relate to my scar, you still have to be able to see the scar. It still has to be recognizable to you. And so I'm a firm believer that we don't have to have the same experience to be able to share in the same emotions. We don't have to have the same story to be able to relate to each other's scars. And so I share mine in the hopes that maybe people will not only relate to me, but see that Jesus is healing, continues to heal, and has healed me. And he wasn't afraid to show his. Oh, I that's think so it's beautiful. It's how we relate to each other, I think. That's beautiful. Now, in terms of sharing your testimony or sharing your wounds or mm-hmm. your scars, how does a person know what they should share yeah, and when. what they should not share, when to share. Because there are times where we have testimonies as mm-hmm. people, but God is saying, not now. Mm-hmm. That's so how, good. How are you able to determine when should I share this? Because I know that I should. Yeah, I think that for me, that's almost like the next question, right? When you get to that place, you're like, okay, one day I'm going to share my scars. When and like how much of the scar? Like, don't show the pus, first of all. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing pretty about that, okay? So no one wants to be showing the infection really deep down into it unless you're the doctor that's helping heal. And I think that's maybe using that analogy. It's for me, I trust the discernment of the Holy Spirit. And I will always ask myself before I'm about to share something, before I'm in the inner interview, I always ask God, God, what's just Elise? And that he would use me as a vessel, that he would speak through me. The last thing the world needs is another me walking around just defending myself and just being Australian. Like, I don't know. (laughs) Like, I think that the way to know is to say, why am I sharing what I'm about to share? And I think for me, motivation is a huge thing. For a really long time, um, there was a lot that happened for using that this scar as an example in my marriage that has never been seen publicly. And there are things that I don't want to be shared that I went through. Like, it's not just one-sided. I think that someone said this once, and I loved it. They said, your side of the story, my side of the story, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. That's right. And so I think that's a really important part to note, is that are you sharing this out of a way to defend yourself in the realm of public opinion? Because I've never really seen it win when people do that. And have you allowed time to clean out the wound to bandage it up and allow God to start the healing process in a way that if you take that bandage off, one, it's not going to make it worse. And two, there is enough healing that's taken place because I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this and I kind of seen those pendulum swing. Our parents were very much, everything's fine. Keep Mm -hmm. things behind closed doors, sweep it under the rug. Both of those analogies work perfectly for most of our generation's parents. And my parents have like been through therapy a little later on in life and later on in their marriage. And dad and I specifically have a lot of conversations where he's like, oh man, there's so much healing that's happened. I wish I could like reparent you. And I'm like, ah, no, you're fine. (laughs) 
I went to therapy too because of it, but you're, you're fine. <laughs> but I think that like there was that and then the pendulum swung to let me just do an Instagram live or a TikTok live real quick and just talk about my ex-boyfriend while I'm bawling my eyes out. And you're like, sweetheart, like, oh my goodness. Like, how about we talk to a therapist about that before we tell the world about it? Exactly. And then also too, I think, just making sure that you're still connected to God when you're sharing. Yep. Because when you're sharing, you don't know what kind of reactions you're going to receive. And you need to be in a place where you can respond appropriately or you can embrace, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people may identify and it might be overwhelming. Yeah. Because then people often have follow-up questions, right? Yes. Because then just like what you just asked me a follow-up question of like, how do you know you're ready? And if I hadn't been through any of this, I'd be like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Jeez, when you feel it's right. Like, there is a few different things. Like, before I ever shared anything for the first time, I will say this. I checked with my parents, my best friend, my pastors, and my therapist. Mm. I had a checklist for me. Hey, do you feel like it's okay if I feel led to share this part of my story or whatever? And sometimes it was yes, and sometimes it was like, ah, I think that one might be a little bit. Okay, cool. No worries. So then you wouldn't share it. So let's Mm-mm. say you wouldn't share it. No. Not at that time. And there's been things that later on I have. And there's been things truly I've looked back and been like, I would have never needed to share that. I'm so glad I didn't because it was coming out of a place. And I did have the right motive. While you're in the healing journey, we can be blinded by our own hurt. And that's a really normal filter to have, right? And so for me, I'd have a bit of a checklist going on of like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And there'd be times I would do interviews because this is a lot of what I do. Where later on, I'd be like, ah, you know what? After the interview, I'd be like, I think they need to probably cut that part out. And not even just with my divorce, in in a lot of different ways, or I, I said too much, or the strength is often the weakness for someone like me who does talk a lot. Has I got a lot of words, guys. I got a lot of words <laughs> and I got a lot of vulnerability ready to go. That on the other side of that, I can overshare. Yes. So always permission to backpedal and be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take that part out, I, you know? I and I mean, thing sometimes. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So is there a checklist that you have or something that you... Well, interestingly enough, I usually am someone who overshares like in person when mm-hmm. I meet someone. If it's a complete stranger, I Hi, he's on my mess. Oh. I love it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, you don't know me. And right, right. I like the idea of people being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And then my background is as a psychologist. So I'm used to people sharing with me. So it's nice for me to make it you know, knowing that I'm not perfect and yeah. that I also have issues. Love that. Yep. But when it comes to my platform, mm-hmm. which is like, I don't know who's watching this. I'm very careful Got about it. what I share. Mm-hmm. So I'm not as forthcoming. And there are things that I want to share, but I, I don't know when the time is right. So I yes. pray and I ask God because I also don't want to be disobedient and mm-hmm. not share testimonies mm-hmm. and glorify mm-hmm. him. But, you know, some of this stuff is kind of a lot. And I've had like people in my life say, don't share that. Yep. You know, because it could ruin you. But sometimes I feel like they're saying that out of fear. And sure. sometimes people are not the same place, whether it's spiritually yep. or, or mentally or emotionally, and they don't understand. That's such a how, good point. You know? I think that's the the part of knowing who your people are. Mm-hmm. Like finding your people and those people will change through seasons. And I, for me, I have had absolutely had times where actually on both sides where people have said to me, very close people to me have said, Elise, you know, you can change your story now. And to me at the time I was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And I almost felt like they were shutting down the story. Like, this is enough of this. Like, yes. You've heard enough of this. This is enough of this. <laughs> we we get it. You went through your divorce. I'm right. like, but people, are, people, when they hear this, are still hearing this for the first time. Now, what they were saying maybe was miscommunicated because I believe they really had a good heart and I know they loved me. And so for me, at the time, I was very hurt by that. And I was like, oh, man, like, God didn't tell Moses to get a new story when he led the people through the exodus, like, out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't have to get a new story and just then become a lawyer. Like, we— And God himself. Right, exactly. Constantly says, I'm the God that— I'm the God that God (laughs) reminds us of the things he's brought us through. So I'm like, um, okay— But I understand a moment when, like I said at the beginning, those scars aren't your whole story. And I think we have to be careful not to get stuck in a chapter. And sometimes when that's the only story we're telling, we are stuck in that chapter. And so for me, that's why I try to be careful to tell a breadth of stories. Like when was the last time I told a new story is a question I ask myself a lot. Or am I still telling my divorce story? Is all my sermon illustrations from Elise as a kid, are there any from 2022 that I'm telling yet? 
And if they're not, are they in the pipe works that I'm like getting healing for to be prepared to tell? Does that make sense? I, I like that. Yeah. And so I think that for me, it's having like a bit of a backpack of like, just I got this story, I got the divorce story, I've got the was in ministry and left story, I've got the moving across the world story, I've got the friendship breakup stories, I've got, which one do we want to go with today? Like pulling out the deck of cards a little bit because God has done so much in my life. Why would I ever want to get stuck in one story? And God has done so much in my life. Why would I not want to tell it? Absolutely. And I think the fact that people can relate to experiences when they're specific, but they can relate to emotions because we all have the same emotions. I think if I ever get stuck on should I share this or not, I'll just go a little bit of a Google Maps view and zoom out a little bit and I'll tell in a vague way. If, does that make sense? And so I'm still able to speak to your experience because I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to feel like I have nothing to say. I know what it's like. And so though we may not have the same life story, though, uh, and I'm sure we don't, we can find common ground. And I think the beauty of humanity is not being able to have the same story because that's God's a God of like unity. He's not a God of the same thing. But I think that when we can find that common ground of here's where our stories crossroads, I think that's the beauty in it. And that's where we find healing. And that's the space that I endeavor to get to is not necessarily, let me tell you exactly how I got this wound and the, the exact words that were said, the exact acts that happened. But let me stop for a moment and be like, hey, how can you relate to this? What can you pull from that? Because if you can't relate to the exact experience, then maybe something in me is actually wanting to tell you right. about the exact experience rather than the motivation of how can we find common ground? Yeah, it's all about your intention, your motivation. I think so. And I don't get that right all the time, by the way. Disclaimer. Your girl is on a journey, okay? We but all are. We all are. I think that that has been a thing because I have seen the beauty in it when someone's related to me and I've walked away being like, wait a second. Technically, I really don't know much more about their story, but somehow yeah. I connected with them. Exactly. And I think that's the beauty in human connection rather than that we had the same story. So if you're ever in doubt, that's what I kind of try to do. But that's rich. I know that you said that the divorce topic has been talked about so much, but it is something that I still get messages about daily mm -hmm. women who have gone through divorce and who are looking for healing. Mm -hmm. For you, why do you think there is so much shame mm. in being divorced, especially being in the church? You being, were you a pastor? Yeah. Yeah, pastor? still am technically, just doesn't have it on my email anymore. Okay. So it turns out God gives you the gifting, doesn't have to be on an email title. <laughs> I didn't know that until like a like couple of years ago. God was like, oh no, you're a pastor. You just you don't, don't have to. Yeah, you just don't get paid by a church anymore. I'm like, they're like Instagram pays you. I'm like, sick. All right. Love that. Love that for us. Doesn't matter. I think that there's so much shame around anything we don't talk about. I think that shame hides in the dark places. And I was just listening to this on the way here. Benjamin William Hastings, that's a long and royal name, it feels like, doesn't it? Yeah. He just released an album. Um, oh, he's a oh, wow. he's <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, he's not even a prince. <laughs> Who knew? He's Irish, though. And he has this song called Dancing With My Shadow. And just the way he uses these words about learning to dance with your shadow and you would like your degrees and all of the smarts behind the things that like I do not have but am so interested in you'd probably have the information education to go behind that of like learning this shadow side of ourselves. and I think that shame creeps in anywhere where we feel like what we did though we went through a negative experience that again becomes who we are the scar becomes who I am I don't have a scar I am a scar and I think that's where shame comes in so with divorce it's just so innately in us. I mean, Jesus was using the church, the, uh, the picture of the bride and groom as the picture to talk about the church and his relationship with us. And so it's so innately, it was always in the design of God for marriage. And the Bible does say God hates divorce. And so that was something I had to wrestle with and actually research. The reason God hates divorce, by the way, just in case someone's lied to you, is because it made the women a victim. It would be like the men were able to, like the woman burnt his dinner, he's able to go and just get another wife. And so it left this woman as a victim. And God doesn't want any of his kids to be out in the cold, to be victims either way. Mm. And so I thought, I always thought that God said he hated divorce because it distorted the perception of him and his love for us. Well, in doing so, right, you imagine being a woman back then and then some man named Jesus comes along and he's talking about the bride and groom and your groom left you. Mm -hmm. Of course it would pervert your relationship. It does. It, all of that is actually 
intrinsically desire. When divorce happens, it breaks the relationship image that God wanted us to be able to see through marriage. I hate divorce too. F to the Y to the I. <laughs> I and I've never believed in marriage more than I do. Is my story there yet? No. I'm I'm still on the little checky thing on those form you have to fill in. I'm still divorced woman. I can't tick married again yet, as we are right now in 2023. But I've never believed in marriage more. I think the fact that something like that would happen and someone left you and there is so much hurt and heartbreak. And what did I do wrong? And this image that you have for the rest of your life that gets broken, I don't know how you wouldn't feel some kind of shame from that. And then it is distorted and increased and emphasized even more by let's not talk about it. Mm, yes. You mean you? Can't, I can't talk about the most traumatic thing that's ever happened in my life? Or like maybe even a person feeling like, people look at them like there's something wrong with them, mm -hmm. like they're damaged or they're broken. And yes, I know what you mean. For me, it was the tilted head. Like, oh, I was always <laughs> getting into, oh my gosh, for a good 18 months to two years. You got divorced? And I was like, don't you dare tilt your head at me. It. I'm sorry. I'm if I get it. one more tilted head at me, and it was just like this little thing. and Or it would be for me, it was like Christians texting me and being like, you're on my heart. And for me, I had this whole blog post, speaking of things we don't actually publish, mm -hmm. I had this whole blog post ready to go of like how like <laughs> biologically it's so dangerous to be sitting on someone's heart and like get off my heart. Like oh my get God. off my heart. You haven't spoken to me in six months. What you're really asking is what happened though? I'm like, get That's off my heart. Get know. off my heart. Get out of my business. Okay. Yeah. So for me, there is those things. It's uh -huh. and all of that adds to it. And to me, when I, I just look at Jesus, because I wish I could tell people, here's what you do to, to stop it. But I've realized I can't control the opinions of others. Mm -hmm. I can't control the well-meaning Christians in my DMs. I can't control the not well-meaning Christians right. in my DMs. Right. <laughs> okay. Of course. I can't control it. You know what I can control? My relationship with God and coming to him and being like, Jesus, did you reject me? And if I look in the Gospels, who was Jesus always going after? Who was he drawing close to? The brokenhearted. The brokenhearted, the ones society had discarded, the ones that they had segregated and said, you can't come in here. I look throughout it. Jesus was always esteeming and drawing close to those people. And so in those moments, I know it sounds easier said than done because it is easier said than done. The moments I feel people are drawing away from me because of my story. I did this especially in my healing journey in the early days. I've never shared this part, but like I would close my eyes and just have this visual of Jesus getting down on his knees at my level and like lifting my chin to see him. Mm. And sometimes it's all I could do to just remind myself that sometimes like people just suck and they just mean but really they just don't understand. And in those moments, I'm so grateful that Jesus came to earth, put on flesh and walked this life to experience what I went through so that though he doesn't have the same story, he knows my scars. He has humanly experienced the same things that you and I go through and has had people misunderstand and criticize and critique and do all the things. And it's in those moments that I don't always get it right and it's really hard to do. But I just remember that those people don't represent Jesus. No, and in those moments when he's holding your chin, he's telling you, look up, mm -hmm. look at me. Mm -hmm. And not at them. Exactly. And that's the hardest thing to do, right? Because our human, again, nature, I love validation so much. Oh my gosh, it's my you. favorite. I love it so much. <laughs> but for me, I think that God starved me of it for a while because I needed to remember. That is deep. But in what ways? Was it just because of the Listen, divorce? In other ways, did he starve you of the validation? Oh, once a year, I get a good fasting from validation uh -huh. <laughs> without my permission, <laughs> right. you know, involuntarily. Whether it was going through my divorce and coming back and almost having this season where it was like the ministry people okay. that had been sending invitations, come here, speak here, do this, do that. Silence. Okay. Not all of them, but just a lot of them. Um, and then when I came off my church staff, that happened again. 
And there would just be seasons of like when I would start to kind of like find my feet in speaking, there was like six months there where I wasn't on the speaking, preaching roster at all. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, what the heck? And he was like, yeah, but will you still come to me for things to say even if you don't have an outlet for it? Mm -hmm. And that was actually the season that he opened up doors to start speaking on Instagram. And by open up doors, I mean, remind me, hey, girl, you've got a microphone in your phone. You don't need one on a church service. And in different ways. And then there was like times after my divorce where I was like, am I even attractive? Like, does do men even want me? And maybe like people might have different experiences, whether you've been through a divorce or not, or your experience on how you went through divorce is different even. But for me, that was a really important thing because of what I had gone through in my marriage. I just didn't even feel like I would ever get attention. And so there was a season of like, seeking validation in just like flirting or text messages or those like when you're lonely and then God, there's a difference between being overlooked and God hiding you. And there was a season where God just like, and still obviously now is hiding me because I think sometimes we need to be hidden and that's not in just in relationships. That's not just on social media. That maybe is in your job and your career. You feel like your boss is just overlooking you and you're doing all the work. There are seasons where I believe that God suffocates us of that validation because if we continue to feed that with human validation, we will continue to go to the thing that's feeding us. That's You're going right. to go to the hand that's feeding you. That's right. And um, that's why he puts me through involuntary yearly fasting of validation because I, my human nature, I love it so much. Well, it's like when Jesus was in the wilderness, like he had to exactly. leave, right? And then he was led by God, by the Holy Spirit to be tempted, Listen. to be tested by the devil, right? And he was tested or with the lust of the flesh, mm -hmm. the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the mm -hmm. things that we crave. Those three things. Those three, three things, things that we crave. It's like, you can have all these things, but- in which way are you going to get it? Are you going to get exactly. it from the way the enemy wants you to get it? By dressing a certain way or by doing things that you shouldn't be doing or God's way. But he does need to kind of take us away and bring us to him for a while. And every time, even in the wilderness, it always cracks me up because for so long it sounded so good when people preached. Because I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in church. And they would always preach like, if you leave this church, you leave the blessing of God. God doesn't take you somewhere without placing you somewhere else. And there are things that, that God will like bring you into a new season while he's taking you out of the old. But I can no longer preach that God doesn't take you out of something unless he's taking you into something else. Because I have seen too much in the Bible and in my own life now that no, 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 no. Pretty much all the time. God was like, hey man, get up and go and I'll show you. I'll show you. Jesus, go into Jesus. How'd you go in the wilderness? Why do you think you're not going to go in the wilderness? And be just wandering for a while. Because God does things. He prepared Abraham by saying, now go, I'll show you. Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. One third of his life was spent feeling like he didn't know what he's doing. And we want to preach that God's not going to take you out of something without putting you somewhere else. And I get this sentiment but I just don't think it's scriptural. Mm -hmm. And so we look at Jesus being tempted and every time the devil is tempting him on one of those three things, every single time what he was saying was skip the process. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey man, yep. he didn't say, oh, hey man, that's at least a Bible <laughs> version. It have, probably had have cuss words in it too, but he was basically like, you can skip this process now. Just yeah. trust me, come over here. And isn't that the biggest temptation in 2023? Absolutely is skip the process. give me the fast fix, give me the fad diet, give me the quick platform, give me this. And I think that that has been the most dangerous moments in my life where something has come to me quickly that God has not prepared me for. Mm. Because you get the light and then Chris Kane always says that if the light that is in you is not bigger than the light that is on you, the light that is on you will destroy the light that is in you. Wow. And I think God doesn't want us to have the platform without the preparation I was about to say he doesn't allow us, but I have seen it happen because you can give into the temptation of skipping the process, but I haven't seen it work out well. Yeah, he gives you free will. Mm -hmm. So, in talking about Jesus and feeling that Jesus was close to you mm. during that time, some people may think that Jesus doesn't love them if they were allowed to go through this this whole situation mm -hmm. of having a divorce, yeah. being a pastor. It's like things are supposed to work out great for you. You're you're a pastor and the daughter of a pastor. Like, come on. <laughs> you know, like, what is this? You may start to think, Jesus, do you love me? Totally. But what scriptures did you, if you remember, yeah. is there any scripture that you really leaned into mm -hmm. to remind yourself that Jesus does love you? And maybe even to remind yourself that 
you can get married again. Yeah. For me, Jude chapter one, it's only one chapter. If you're like <gasps> love achieving things and taking things off your list, read Jude in one day. Like I read a book of the Bible today. Jude chapter one, verse two in the message version, it says, rest, everything's coming together, relax, everything's going to work out, open your heart, love is on the way. And I remember God speaking to me so clearly. And then one of my life verses, i for some reason, I'm wondering if it's Isaiah 54, but I'm pretty sure it is. Again, in the message version, just for me, that translation was phenomenal. If it's not Isaiah 54, in the lower thirds right now, you'll be seeing that it is a uh, different verse, but I'm pretty sure Isaiah 54, the message version of it, God continues to this day. He is speaking and using the analogy of a barren woman that was embarrassed and had a husband walk away from her. And he is saying, um, it gets me emotional every time, clear lots of room, create the tent pegs and spread them out wide because you're going to need so much room for your growing family. And it talks about how God is rebuilding her with rubies and diamonds and the foundation. And you were embarrassed and you were, your husband was with you, but then left you. And he, But you're not going to be embarrassed. God is not going to walk away from you. And if anybody wants to take you to court, God is going to dismiss them as a liar. And so to me, that I get chills and I still talk about it because, and I, anyone that ever is like, at least you have a good verse. I'm like, girlfriend or boyfriend, guy, that's a friend, you get it. Like go and read that. I read it every single day, every single day. It, through heart, I got it when I was 18, my very first heartbreak in, from high school. Mm -hmm. And I remember in my divorce, it came back so much stronger and gave me so much life because sometimes we just need to be reminded that God's got you and He knows the things that you don't even have words for yet. He knows the embarrassment because shame is a commonly worded phrase these days, it feels like in our world. Oh, yeah. But even the word embarrassed still has that, like, we don't like to say we're embarrassed. I'm dealing with shame. I was embarrassed. The most shame-filled moments have been the ones that I've been most embarrassed about. How interesting, because when I thought to ask you this question, embarrassed was the word that yeah. I wanted to use. Yes. For some but reason, for some reason we I don't. said Isn't it shame. Interesting? Isn't it? No, and I don't, I didn't realize that until right now either. But we still have this, I was just reading, um, listening to the new Brene Brown book about the Atlas of the Heart, I think, where she basically in the book, she literally, it's like a dictionary for emotions. Mm -hmm. So she spends the books like spelling out emotions because she's like, we know what things make us mad or sad or happy. That's it. The word embarrassed. And she's, I, I remember being like, wow, we don't, I don't say something embarrassed me easily. But that's really what I'm saying. And so the fact that even this verse in the message translation of it, which is basically like a colloquial way to phrase the Bible, he says you won't be embarrassed, to me just gave me so much hope. And then I could say Jeremiah 29, 11, but what to me makes that so strong for I know the plans I have for you is the 11 verses before where he says, hey, you're going to be in exile for this long. So plant gardens, marry, plan to stay, have babies. Basically saying hey, this process is going to be a little longer than you think. Mm -hmm. But once you've come through this time, yes. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. So don't try to skip this healing process too early. Even if you don't get married there in that devastating moment in your life, what he's saying is sow seeds in the ground. Mm -hmm. Have some fruit from this season. And when we're through this, my future for you is one filled with hope. And so I think that those for me. Those are beautiful. Yeah. Those are those are powerful. And I know it's so important when you are someone who is going through life and you're in Christ, or even if you're not in Christ and you want to get to know God, it's important when you read the word to meditate on it and to really allow the word to come into your mm -hmm. body and to mm -hmm. eat those yes. words. Yes. It's not enough to just read it. it you may not feel what Elise felt if you go and read Jude for the first time. But as you continually read it over mm -hmm. and over and you get it into your spirit, those words will yeah. manifest. Yes, they will. And that's the thing, isn't it? Is it the Bible? I think, I, I believe it's in 1 Timothy, but Paul is writing this letter to this his young like mentee, rather, Timothy. And he's like, hey, every single thing in the Bible, every scripture, it's God breathed. All of it is useful. All of it. It may be different in 2023 to how they read it in the 60s, but all of it is useful to equip us and to teach us and to educate, to rebuke us because y'all know we need rebuking. Like I do, maybe it's just me, but like I need rebuking every other day, if not every day. But all of it is useful. And so I can't tell you how many times I have read the same verse a million times and suddenly that morning, mm -hmm. that afternoon, that evening, that thing just jumps off the page at me. That's what we mean when we say it's alive. That's what... 
like has been so helpful with me of like, cool, you can like, we joked before about reading the whole book of Jude, but rather than that, can you read one verse Mm -hmm. and keep going over it? And that is meditation. Like as it's foundations in the Bible, in scripture, meditate on this word day and night. People don't don't know what that means. They think it's yoga. Yeah. I'm like, cool. They, they stole it from us. Like we started it, man. Always a counterfeit for everything. Isn't there? And meditation is simply going over and over and over, fixing your eyes on that thing. Mm -hmm. And in a world that is so noisy and that he's got so many distractions and asking us to be focused on so many things, we need to decide what we're going to fix our eyes on. And if you are someone who really wanted to build a relationship with God or to reestablish a relationship with God, especially when you're in a place where you feel your lowest, Mm -hmm. what are some ways a person can do that? Because I know me personally, I love my devotion time with God, but I can get bored sometimes doing the same old thing. It can start to just feel it, like yep. a routine. Mm-hmm. So there are different ways to connect with God. Yeah, what I think some- 2020 showed us that, right? Uh-huh. Of like when <laughs> yeah. the church doors are closed, how's your faith? Like there was an open heaven, but for so many people, the church doors closed and they were like, God? Mm-hmm. We're like, hey, he's right there. Like it's the whole God's everywhere thing. But I think that for me, that's why we actually started Club Devotion. Me and my best friend, Katie. Tell us about Club we, Devotion. We started Club Devotion in just, it was it's a year old like this week, I think actually random. That's so crazy. Yeah. Because we were looking around and she was on staff at the church I was at as well. And so when we felt God like moving us into a new season, again, calling out without calling into yet, we were praying about it. And I had this breakthrough boot camp, which was this six week course that I created and it was helping women, but these women weren't going anywhere. They were refusing to leave. And I was like, y'all, it's a six week course. They were like, oh, we don't care. We're going to be here on this Zoom channel next week. Like if you don't show up, we'll just pray. And I was like, okay, well, what do we do now? And so we both felt God drop in our spirit because the thing that would grieve me is if I would travel somewhere to a women's conference or we'd have one and I'd see these women coming in and being inspired and equipped and encouraged by the sermon and the worship. But then they're going back to their lives and who's going back with them. And I was seeing so many amazing environments of encouragement, but not a lot of friendship. And then I would see these other places where it's like Bumble for friends or like social activities, Soho House, whatever it is. People are connecting. Are they being equipped in their faith? Right. Where is it that is having both? Because I think exactly what you're saying is like, it gets lonely. We like... God is there with us at all times, but sometimes you need someone that can look you in the eyes, that can touch you with your permission. It is going to be okay. You're going to get through this. And so that human aspect of the world we live in, I just don't believe we can get through life without it. I mean, people preach that you can, and I love that for you. Maybe I'm different. I need my people, and I don't need a lot of them but I need you on the couch with me some days. And so for us, we started Club Devotion for women and it accidentally went global. We did not mean for this to happen. Mm -hmm. Australia was like, we're in. England was like, we're in. Canada was like, hey guys, wait for us. We just meant for it to be in America of like, hey, if you like like my devotionals, because I was writing devotionals regularly, and you like how I see the Bible, we're talking about Elise's version of the Bible, we're going to start this thing. And so every month I write a devotional and we're going through the same parts of the Bible together. And every day they get a voice prompt from me. Mm -hmm. So you get the Australian accent every day. And every week we come together for a club meeting. Very Little Rascals-esque, if you will. But it's not the he-man women haters, obviously, because it's a women's club. But we get together on Zoom and we hang out, we talk, we have games nights, we have happy hours together. We go deep in the word. We have connect groups. We have mums groups and singles groups. It's just like grown because Katie and I were like, let's just create a community and see what God does with it. And so for us, it was literally breathed out of, I'm lonely and don't have friends after Mm -hmm. COVID. And my devotionals got real dry and monotonous. And for me, being in the Word, being like, God, what do you have for them next month? Mm -hmm. He's speaking to me in a whole different way. It's so crazy. And I'm also like, okay, so I've written the devotional, but what am I doing for my time with God? And God's like, hey, let's go have some fun. Like, turns out we need both. You can't just have a marriage on, like, let's just go real deep and do like the love languages quiz one more time. Or let's talk about like (laughs) our conflict styles and attachment styles again this evening. Like, goodness gracious, that sounds boring and exhausting. And you can't just go to Disneyland every day. You need both. My mom would say you need the meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. God love her British soul. (laughs) You need balance. You need balance. And so for us, it was like, we need to know the word of God like never before. In 2023, 
we've got to know what the Bible says. Yeah. And you need girls to go to battle with. And so that's how Club Devotion was created and we're continuing it. And it's just kind of like Katie and I are both like, what the heck? Like we didn't mean to, in a sense, start this thing, which just feels like the story of my life. If I had an autobiography right now, it'd either be I'm an adult until I'm a three-year-old or it would be called like I didn't mean to do this. Like probably, oops, I did it again (laughs) because I feel like God does things in my life and I just say yes to taking a step. And Club Devotion was kind of just like that. And it's the biggest way for me and has been the most refreshing thing for me Mm -hmm. to create a community that I get to be a part of. Well, it's great because there are so many women that are lonely who really just want to make a friend that it's really difficult making a friend as an adult. It's just Isn't that awkward? awkward it's and like, it's, what do you say these days? Or like who, who do you even find? Do you lead with trauma in the line at Target? Or do you like lead with like, I noticed you got the same shirt as me. Sick. Like how do <laughs> we do even it? Even then you yeah. are, are you gonna say, well, can we exchange numbers? I mean right. even that's like kind of embarrassing, mm-hmm. right? So I think it's nice to have a place where women can be friends with people who genuinely want to be friends with them mm-hmm. and talk about God. Because a lot of times when people are in Christ, that's all that kind of comes out of their mouth. They love God so much and it just overflows. And people can be annoyed by that but sometimes. Mm-hmm. And they may say, like, can we talk about something else? Totally. Or just feel like they can't connect and they're just not interested. So having a place where you really have both yeah. people who actually want to have these conversations. It's been crazy powerful. because, it, and then also in that, like le- teaching all of us how to be able to have those conversations about God and talk about God and let's get deep. And then it is okay to also have a games night on Zoom and just like do it. We're having our first meetup in Atlanta next month in February. It's the first time we're ever doing a thing together because again, we didn't mean to do this. We were just like, hey, let's just see who else wants friends and to talk about God and also be able to, if that's your thing, have a glass of wine or have a coffee club or like I said, have the games night. God is so amazing and He's so layered I think he loves my jokes. And at the same time, I can come to him when I'm heartbroken. Of course. And I think that that is we're missing out on God if all of our friendships either are void of God Mm -hmm. or all of them are deep all the time. It's that balance that has just been so beautiful. And sometimes if you feel like your relationship with God is dry or it's scary or you don't even know where to start, Mm -hmm. all that's missing is just kind of like having another facet of him. You might just have been like a kaleidoscope in just one image for too long. Like take a second and take a step back and the way you see God is different to how I see him. And I love hearing from other women, specifically their experience with God, because it broadens my perspective yes. too. And so you don't want to be in an echo chamber of just you and God all the time. Mm-hmm. It's, he it's fellowship. Things. It's exactly. fellowship. Exactly. And the Bible talks about not Perfecting. refraining from yeah. that. You, we need each other. And I think that that, I always feel close to God after I've hung out with my, like, sisters. Being someone who was brought up in the church and maybe had to behave in a certain way or have a certain light shining on you all the time, people are always looking at you and watching you, and then being married and being someone's wife and having to learn all of that, now that you are just Elise Mm -hmm. and you're you're doing life in, in a very authentic way, how do you think women can be more authentic versions of themselves after so much has happened in their lives? Yeah, that's such a big question. Goodness gracious. I think that I still am on a journey of that. I think that there are days I'm better at it than others. We talked about at the very beginning of like the oversharing versus pretending everything's fine, like finding that balance even. I remember for me starting to feel like myself again because especially if someone's been through heartbreak or had a significant relationship leave their life, whether that's a parent or a friend or a marriage, for me, I had lost sight of who God created at least to be, which simply means I didn't know what to order off the menu. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what kind of music I liked. I didn't know how I would design an apartment or a house. And so some of that authenticity was actually a lot more practical than I first gave it credit for. There was a lot of layers of healing and therapy in there as well and a lot of changing of my friends. And one of the best compliments I got when I came back to LA, because I went back to Australia for like four months just to grieve and get some good private therapy. And 
then I knew God was calling me back. And for me, it was a friend that looked at me and was like, you just like have no drama in your life anymore. And I think she kind of meant it as like, I was boring, but I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Like I'm really trying so hard to not have drama in my life. And for me, like, because I had gotten addicted to drama without meaning to, when you have been in such intense situations for so long, it kind of becomes a crutch. You think and it's normal too. I didn't know who I was without the drama. Yeah. And so for me, it was the depth of that kind of revelation and listening to different types of music, trying different foods. And it was that, again, the balance, almost like those ingredients to create this like authentic pie a little bit in relearning. And relearning happened by unlearning. Who am I not? Who did God not call me to be? Who did I allow other people to make me? Who did I listen to more than the whisper of the Holy Spirit? And in unlearning a lot, it was so scary because it almost feels like you're losing parts of the ship you're on and you're like, are we going to go down? And Paul talks about in Acts when they had this shipwreck and he's like, but we made it safely to the island. He never said the ship made it. The ship like was not okay by the time they got there. The things I had gone into my marriage with were not okay on the other side of it. It was like a whole bunch of throwing things overboard and just being like, well, don't need this anymore. Wow, I really thought I needed that. Turns out I don't. Oh, I really liked that. It's like the hoarder that wants to just like keep all of the memories there, but you don't need it. And so- You made it safely. Exactly. You, you are still here. And part of that was like, this is the big one that is still that thing that I try to like bring back on the boat all the time is that people pleasing. Mm. I just like mm. being liked. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a lot of my identity had been wrapped up and can tend to be wrapped up in what makes other people happy as opposed to who God's called me authentically to be. And I notice when I go into that mode, it's the strength is the shadow. My strength is that I can connect with people from all different walks of life. The shadow of that is I can be whoever that person needs me to be and shape shift and just kind of like be a bit of a chameleon in a green room. And that's not who God called me to be. No, because then it's like, who are you? Exactly. Right? And so for me, that was diving deep into like that was really scary work mm -hmm. because and still is work I'm doing because for me, I was so scared that if I was honest about who I was, people would walk away. People wouldn't like it. And they did and they didn't as well. Mm -hmm. Just FYI, those fears happen, but it is so worth it. It's like the things you're scared of happening if you're honest the truth is sometimes they do happen, but I've never looked back and regretted that for one second once I've come out the other side. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That is so powerful. And it's, I just want to add to that by saying that, you know, sometimes when you talk to God and you ask him to help you to become the person he created you to be, he's going to ask you to do things that you may be terrified to mm -hmm. do. And, or you just might not think it's, what everyone else is going to find pleasing. And even for me personally, I remember asking God, like, I really want like a hairstyle that's like authentic and unique. And, you know, I want to be able to like rock this hairstyle on my show. So like, show me all the wig websites, show me all the weaves. And he's like, but I gave you hair. Wow. Wear your own hair. Dang like just God. do your hair and wear your own hair. So today's the first time I'm wearing my own oh, hair it's so on beautiful. the show. Thank you. That's um, such a cool analogy to yeah. like, because that's, we've all got our things, right? Yeah. The things we, we know God gave us, but we want to make look a different way. We don't feel super comfortable in exactly how he made me. And right. so for me, I like for me, my freckles were a thing I hated for so long. And now in summer, I'm like obsessed with them. But it took me the last five years, like up until my whole life, I was always trying to hide them. And like, it's just these ways God made us. And for so long, we're trying to hide or shape something to look different. And God's like, it's it's actually part of how I created you. Yes. And I didn't make a mistake. I didn't mess it up. You're perfect. Yeah. You're it's perfect. just like crazy to think that. And speaking of meditation, to bring it all back around, the fact that God made you, not just accidentally, not as a template, there is not one human that is the same. He made us thoughtfully, intentionally, on purpose, for a purpose, Listen, let that sit with you for a while. And suddenly those things that we're trying to hide find their voice again. 
find their look again. And you're like, wait, why was I looking for something unique when I am unique? That's right. And that's the coolest part. So oh, I love that so thank much. You. I love that. That's so cool. Thank Thanks you. for sharing that. Yes. Well, thank you, Elise. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing with us and just empowering us women to be authentic, to show our scars in an appropriate and godly way and giving us this beautiful platform to connect with other women. Where can they find you? Mm, well, thank you so much for having me for it. This has been a really fruitful and like, like, I feel like I took a deep breath on this couch, so you know? I feel like yeah. It. I love those conversations. They can find me here on the couch, obviously, <laughs> right now, um, on Instagram at Elise, E-L-Y-S-E. They can go to my website, elisemurphy.com, and that has a link all about Club Devotion is all on the website. We're working right now to get that URL up. Like I said, it's kind of accidental how Club Devotion happens, so we're back-ending the process of that. <laughs> so that'll be up soon, but right now they can just go to elisemurphy.com to get all the links, or it's on my Instagram and yeah, and if they join, they can just use the code first month and they'll get 50% off the first month. So That's awesome. um, yeah, it's really cool. So they sh you should definitely come on over and <laughs> hang out. It'd be great. But thank you again so much thank for having you. me. Really appreciate thank it. You. Of course. And thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.